page. So on Colin <coughs> Norman Tobin, pages one and two on my 9372-0032. My 1030s, you know they're gonna come up when I can get this finished taken care of. Um, Council, have all your appearances, please. Norman Tobin, Good morning, Aaron. Joseph Hong for Council. Good morning, Aaron. Joseph Hong for Counter Defendants. Stokes, Jimmy Jack, Revocable Trust, Unity, and F. Wanderer. Good morning, Your Honor. Caleb Anderson for Sun City Anthem Community Association. Jan Sadana Whitty for Mission Star Mortgage. Okay. Um, Council, first issue. The only person I got courtesy copies from was the only person who's not really in the case. Yes, I am looking at one table full of attorneys. Your Honor, that, the issues are been dismissed in this case. We haven't filed anything. We're, we're here because Ms. I'm, I'm not. I'm not pointing out anybody individually. I'm looking at a table full of attorneys and not a courtesy copy among you. So just remember, folks, please. Uh, I please, 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 please. Okay? Understood my apologies, Your Honor. Yeah, I mean... Now, when you heard that prefatory statement, here's the next issue with this, folks. The court doesn't think that it can really hear almost every single motion that's set for this case today for a multitude of reasons. First off, Ms. Tobin, you are not in this case you are current, okay, the only role, Ms. Tobin, you are here in this case, is represented by counsel in your role as trustee of the Gordon B. Hansen Trust. Excuse me. Let me finish, okay. There was an order on July 9th. There was a hearing in front of Senior Judge Barker and Mr. Kopich sought to request to have the firm withdraw as counsel. Shouldn't have been as an individual. That was he was here when I was out of the jurisdiction. It should have never happened. It was meant to be as your role of trustee. Let's be a hundred percent clear. This court, it was abundantly clear. No one can file a pleading and try and get it set for hearing when this judge is not in the jurisdiction and it inadvertently gets set. Okay? This court did detailed findings of fact conclusions of law. In this case and its underlying consolidated case, only Nona Tobin as trustee of the Gordon Hansen Trust was the only intervener in either of the two consolidated cases. In the case before it was consolidated into this department, there was a pending motion to intervene that was never heard. In this case, in this department, the only motion that was granted as clearly detailed in this court's finding of facts and conclusions of law was Nona Tobin as trustee of the Gordon Hanson Trust. And I'm using that term generically. I do appreciate that there has been two different ways that that has been phrased, the Gordon B. Hanson, and I say Gordon Hanson Trust, but sometimes it's been the Gordon Hanson Trust, Gordon B. Hanson Trust, Gordon B. Hanson Trust 2008, Gordon B. Hanson Trust 2008, was it amended 2011. What, however, this court's never been provided a copy of the trust document, but the court has to rely on the parties to present the only intervention granted by this court was Nona Tobin as trustee of, I'm just generically going to say the Gordon B. Hansen Trust. That is the only order that this court intended to sign. Now, after that order was signed, the court is fully appreciative that the parties kept on using intermittently various individual and trustee should have never happened. The court clarified that in its findings of fact and conclusions of law. The court cannot grant and did not ever intend to grant and the court even 
raised and brought, and it was brought to the court's attention about the inadvertence. The court then, parties were supposed to have gotten that clarified. Now, because the court parties did not do what they needed to do does not mean that something happened that didn't happen. There was then a subsequent motion to intervene that was filed but never heard after the trial already had been completed in 2019. That was never heard. That was never granted to have someone feel free to sit down if that's more comfortable. Stand up, whatever's more comfortable for you, whatever. Um, feel free to be comfortable. But let the court finish because court is very important, okay? It's this court's intention always was, always meant to be, based on what was provided to this court from an evidentiary basis, based on the documents provided to this court, that the only role, despite the fact that when then the trustee then had Mushkin Associates, including Mr. Kopich, his counsel was supposed to be the trustee. Now, because the parties did not correctly inform the court, Party should have done the correct notification to the court. Because you all didn't, that's, you know what, it is what it is. The parties have a duty of candor to the court. The parties have a duty to inform the court correctly. It doesn't always happen. It should have happened. But that does not mean that somebody's in the case who was not in this case. When it was correctly brought to the court's attention and shown through documentation that it was the Gordon B. Hansen Trust and Ms. Tobin as trustee, that's the only party that was ever granted intervention. That's the only party that this court ever granted intervention to. That being said, subsequently, and here's another important thing that needs to be stated. Thereafter, the law firm of Mushkin and Associates and Mr. Kopich, interchangeably I'm using those terms, okay, became counsel of record of even of Ms. Tobin as trustee of the Gordon B. Hansen Trust, and even though they should have looked at their own client and realized it was only the singular, singular client, even because they then subsequently filed things on behalf of both, and just because, remember, people file things, the clerk's office accepts everything, okay? And this court, just because the court will sign an order submitted by the parties, is the party's obligations to ensure that the party's names and everything is correct on a caption. This court does not, cannot, and has no obligation to look and ensure that the parties have correctly said their own clients' names. That's the attorney's jobs to do that. So, that being said, thereafter, I will tell you, the Law Offices of Mushkin and Associates, it was not until August 22nd they, they even submitted the proposed order withdrawing as counsel for Ms. Tobin in any capacity, I'll phrase it, but the only capacity they should have done it in is trustee of the Gordon B. Hansen Trust. But the only capacity they could have done it in is trustee, but even whatever capacity they did it, whatever capacity they represented Ms. Tobin, the proposed order did not even come to this court for the July 9th hearing until August 22nd. That order was signed by this court. It was appropriately crossed out because of various different ways it was submitted to this court. I'm not sure if any of you saw the proposed order or not, but it was, it was returned to counsel. That order has never been filed to this court's notice. Now let me see. If it's been filed while I've been on the bench today, I do not know. My law clerk and I both checked this morning up until around 8.30 this morning when this court got on the bench. As of approximately 8.30 this morning, that order has not been filed. That means that every single pleading filed by anybody other than Mushkin and Associates on behalf of anybody named Tobin in any capacity is a rogue pleading. That means this court cannot consider anything filed on behalf, regardless of any characterization. You may have heard this court, because I think you may have already been sitting in the gallery at the time I cited a couple of cases, one being Division of Family Services, about orders. I'm not sure if you heard me cite that or not, but I did cite that 
few moments ago with regards to another case, and the case also Rust. Those are two cases where the court even made sure I repeated it nice and slowly. I not only said it for that case, but realizing you were in the gallery just in case, knowing I was going to repeat it again for this case, and I will repeat it again for this case. Give me two seconds to get back to that case citation. I will state it again in one second, please. As a matter of law, the court's oral pronouncement from the bench on motion is not effective for any purpose, and this is paraphrasing, until it is memorialized as a written order signed by a court and filed and entered with notice of entry thereof. CEG, Division of Child and Family Services, 8th Judicial District Court, 120 Nevada, 445, 92 P3D, 1239, 2004 case. Rust v. Clark County School District, 103 Nevada, 747 P2D, 1380, 1987. That means the oral pronouncements of Senior Judge Barker sitting for this court on July 9th, an oral pronouncement withdrawing, of course, does not have any force in effect on a motion withdraw counsel until said written order wasn't even submitted until August 22nd, so the court couldn't have signed anything. But Court did sign it, just in case. Court actually kept the run slip, just so I just have it here in front of me. Um, signed it, returned it. Like I said, uh, let's look to see. Like I said, as of about 8:30 this morning, it hadn't been filed. I don't know if it's been filed <coughs> since 8:30 this morning. But it does not appear that it has. But once again, it does not show up on the system. So I don't know. Sometimes it takes an hour or so, or whatever to go through the system, but it was returned back to legal wings, whether it got filed or not, don't know, but it did get returned to be filed. It's not been filed. There is no notice of entry thereof. So while I'm very appreciative, Ms. Tobin, you have submitted a lot of documents. You can appreciate under applicable appellate law as there is still counsel of record, and that counsel did file as counsel of record. Now, albeit this court would find incorrectly when it filed, when it first came into the case, said it was both counsel of record of you in the individual capacity and as trustee, but even if you took it in that broadest sense, when it withdrew, it didn't file the order, did not file notice of entry thereof, so every single document that you, Ms. Tobin, filed are all rogue documents that this court cannot consider. Now, the Mushkin firm did file an opposition to one of the Sun City documents, so the court can take into consideration an opposition that was filed. I believe that was filed on the 22nd of August. I've got all the, every single document who filed it. We did it all like in red to try and balance out every single one that was filed, but that's problem number one in this case, just to let you know. i got to go through a couple other issues before I'm going to let people speak, because I'm sorry for my 10.30s that get to wait. I'm going to tell you the 10 o'clock probably is going to want to reschedule for the default, because we're probably going to need to reschedule for the default. I didn't see anybody here at 10 o'clock for that default, so we were moving it on. There was a 10 o'clock Wells Fargo default. We didn't see anybody here on time, so we were going to vacate that, but I assume everybody else is here for the 10.30s, and we'll be with you so shortly as we can. Um, second issue. There is a whole series of documents filed after there was documents filed with regards to an appeal in this case. There is a case called Honeycutt as well as NRCP most recent 62.1, which precludes slash limits the court from doing a whole bunch of other things that is being requested of this court, which precludes a whole bunch of other challenges for relief that's being asked of this court. There's additional procedural issues with regards to motions kind of for reconsideration of things that happened over a year ago, way past deadlines, 
even in addition to the non-party issues, the still have attorney of record, and I don't see anyone from the Mushkin firm here, correct? Nobody from the Mushkin firm? I'm looking around, not unless those, I'm looking, I see people from other law firms that I can recognize, but I don't think anybody's now joined the Mushkin firm, right? The other three counsels sitting in here? You're not? I don't think so. Okay, just making sure somebody walked in. So, I got that other <coughs> issue. Then I've got a whole bunch of things that got filed without permission, things called supplements, untimely joinder documents that without court. I've got things that are still set supposedly on 910, an opposition and a counter motion. I got things supposedly set for motion for attorney's fees and costs, set for 910 and a thing called an opposition and a counter motion for 910 that's not even getting to where we are today. Then I've got things that say that they're set for 54 relief. I, there's a whole bunch of issues. So I've got a morass. But the biggest challenge for this court is this court really doesn't see that I can really hear anything filed, Ms. Tobin, by you because of the challenges of the attorney and the challenges of the intervention. So the court really has two ways of handling this. One, to let you speak first, now that I've kind of given a broad introduction, so that you have an understanding of where the court is coming from. Because I, I understand you, you think you're representing yourself, but you can't. I, the challenge is the court's not even supposed to let you speak because you're represented by counsel, and yet you're only here, and I don't see anyone from the Mushkin firm here. So I'm not sure if you want me to continue this whole morass another time to see if somebody from the Mushkin firm is going to appear because... No. So let me, before you speak, here's what I was going to see if the other parties wanted to do. Since you all are here, Ms. Tobin is here, is at least, even though she, currently the council has not withdrawn, see what Ms. Tobin's position is, let her speak if she wishes to do so. If she doesn't wish to do so because she's still represented by council, but at least if she wishes to do so with that broad introduction because she's a pro se litigant, and I don't want you in any way to speak to your disadvantage without knowing what the issues are, which is why this court was trying to give you that long introduction so that you understood, because if you say you don't want to speak because you're still represented by council, you welcome to do so, but I'm going to ask counsel on behalf of the other parties if they have an objection that if Ms. Tobin wants to at least say something to let her potentially speak and then the court to consider whether I can even hear that versus resetting everything for another day to see if I can even hear it or not hear it while I appreciate people are here. So I'm not sure what the, everybody wishes to do. So I'm going to go one by one at that table first just to see what their position is to see if they have object to letting me hear you speak at all because you're technically represented by counsel based on what all the pleadings show. <coughs> Mr. Hong, just the short version, please. Short version. Ms. Tobin cannot speak as an individual because she is not a party as an individual. She cannot. Now, whether she wants to speak as the trustee, so be it. But she cannot either because she's represented by counsel at this time. So that's the short version. Okay. We, we do not want to come back for this, Your Honor. Uh, I'm here because, and counsel for the HOA is here, number one, because these rogue documents cannot be considered, including in the rogue, including in the rogue documents, is a list pendants. That needs to be completely stricken. Well, well I mean, they're, they're, let's, let's not go to the merits of anything. I okay. just asked my okay. court simple question is whether anybody at the table to the left, closest to the jury box, had that, an objection, that, objection, or had a, or was agreeable to letting Miss Tobin speak if she wished to speak, and the court in no way was going to require a pro se litigant, who's technically not a pro se litigant because you're not in the case as a pro se litigant, right. and you still have counsel. But since you're here, <clears throat> to allow or provide her the opportunity to speak if she wished to speak, I'm not saying which way the court's going to go. I just want to hear everybody's position. Okay, and my position again, as the trustee. Ms. Tobin, as the trustee for the trust, that's a party, cannot speak because, number one, she's still represented by counsel, and even if she was not, as the court is aware, an entity, she can't represent herself as an entity. She just can't. So that's why she can't speak. HOA. 
Um, I've got the same position as Mr. Hong, either as as the trustee, inappropriate here on her own, and as an individual, she's not a party to the case. Okay. And sorry, Mr. Hong, as much as I know who you've represented, do you mind just for clarity of the record, say who you represent, please? Uh, yes, all of the counter remaining counter defendants other than the HOA, so which would be uh, the Stokes as trustees for the Jimmy Jack Irrevocable Trust, Yoon Lee, the individual DBA manager, F. Barnard. Okay, thank you. Next, please. Good morning, Donald for Nation Star. Um, I don't know that I even have a position because Nation Star was dismissed from this case. Uh, like I said earlier, we're here because Mr. Lynn named us in the appeal um, without getting to the merits of that. Um, I really don't have a position either way. No position. Okay. So. Ms. Tobin, you've heard objection, objection, no position. You're here, though, today. So here's what the court's going to do. I am going to hear what you have to say, not saying that I can consider what you have to say because I have two objections. But since you're here, from at least a courtesy standpoint, because you're here, you filed it, I'm at least going to let you speak to hear what you have to say, but not saying that I can consider anything that you have to say, and I'm not requiring you to speak. You understand that, so you can perfectly say, I don't wish to speak, or you can give the, okay, do you understand that? Yes. Okay. I'm not saying I can consider anything that you're about to say as well, you understand that as well, right? Yes. I would like to speak. Okay. And um, I think it's Rule 41A that, uh, says that the, the uh, council has to withdraw. It also has a section that says that the court has the discretion to let a person speak even in open court, even if they are represented. Um, I, I first started filing into the consolidated cases in 2016, and the pro se motion of November 15th of 16 was granted when I signed as a trustee, as a pro se. Originally, um, there were two beneficiaries of the trust, and so there was an issue. And so the court required, uh, since uh, Sun City Anthem filed a motion to dismiss per Rule 41 because I didn't have an attorney. The court heard that on April 27th of 17. And I have the transcripts, and I think I made them available. At the um, April 27th, 17th uh, hearing, the court denied Sun City's motion to dismiss my claims for not having an attorney as an individual because I had individual claims. It was in the record, and it's in the transcript. And Sun City Anthem was instructed to write the order, but they did not. And um, at the following meeting, well, there was corporate counsel check on May 23rd of 17th. And that's when Joe Coppedge came to um, that corporate counsel uh, check. And so that was met. And then at the um, uh, May 25th, 17 meeting, um, at hearing, the court um, accepted a stipulation and agreement from between uh, Sun City Anthem and Joe Coppedge that the claims of Nona Tobin, the individual, and Nona Tobin, the um, trustee, would be dismissed to go to uh, mediation uh, per 38.310. I did that. I went to mediation, both as an individual and as a trustee. Um, and um, so that order, which from the May 20, I mean, yeah, the May uh, 25th hearing of 17, Sun City Anthem didn't enter that order uh, until September 20th of 17. And at that time, they failed to put in that at the prior hearing that the uh, court de 
denied Sun City Anthem's February 23rd, 17th motion to dismiss, excuse me, the um, March 22nd, 17th motion to dismiss was denied as to the individual. And Sun City Anthem did not put that in the order. Meanwhile, Sun City Anthem um, kicked me off my elected board position as an individual, which I'm elected not because I was a uh, trustee, but because I own my own property and I'm a Sun City Anthem homeowner of 15 years in good standing. And I was removed by operation of law because I'm a party to this case. That's never been before this court, never been raised before this court in any manner whatsoever, no. correct? No, but I'm telling you that I am aggrieved because First Sun City Anthem did not provide me the mandated alternate dispute resolution procedures required in Sun City's um, CCNRs 16. It says it's called limits on litigation. So what I'm saying is at first I'm forced to litigate because they would not accept an offer before litigation and before I was elected to the board to get out of the case. All they had to do was tell the truth, but they couldn't do that. They didn't do that. And so now they forced me to be in this and I've spent $47,000 on attorney's fees even trying to represent myself. So a lot of this whole thing never had to happen if Sun City Anthem followed the rules and told the truth. So one last thing. Because I have been a party, it's in the record. If you look at the joint case conference report, of May 15th of, of 18, written by a nation star. I am there as an individual as well as a trustee. When the uh, Sun City filed that absolutely unwarranted um, motion for summary judgment and none of the uh, material that I had provided to the attorney for counter motion and, and very strong evidence showing that the opposing parties do not have standing to be in this case. Nation Star, because they do not, and their own, everything in this court record shows they are not the beneficial owner of that deed of trust. And Jimmy Jack did not have an admissible deed. The absolute only way that this court could find the way that you found was by uh, these opposing parties misinforming the court about the court record so that I would be excluded as a party and my documents would all be precluded from entry into the record. So one last thing is that because when, when you're filing for a quiet title claim under NRS 40.0.0 and you're asking for declaratory relief under NRS 30.0.0, etc. There is under NRS 11.0.7.0 a five-year statute of limitations. And so, I've been in this case for three years, and I was not going to let them get me past that deadline and then still say, well, you're not a party there. I have a right under the law to make a claim the exact same way, and I was admitted into this case in the exact same way that Nation Star was admitted, as a defendant in intervention to make a claim. And I made that claim. Since this court has decided by oral 
proclamation, apparently, that I that all the stuff that's in the record showing me as an individual is not true because opposing counsel said something different. Then I have already filed to meet that five-year deadline another case where I'm going to just go directly for it because if I'm not in this, if I'm not a party, and therefore, you know, my appeal that I've paid for as an individual is not going to be recognized because I, they explicitly did not name me in the motion for summary judgment, the joinder, and it's all over that um, June 24th order that I'm not a party. If I'm not a party, then I will just go to Department 22 where that other case is set up. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Tobin, as you, as you, a couple things that you said, and, and let's be clear. The court on the findings of fact, conclusions of law, and judgment filed by this court on June 24, 2019, and then the notice of entry thereof was on the same day. Okay. In that order, the court, and I was trying to summarize it just to give you a little bit of background today. So, so it wasn't an oral pronouncement today. It's in a written order of this court with notice of entry thereof, consistent with applicable case law. Is this court was presented not only by evidentiary support presented by, it was basically by all the different parties, including yourself, that Ms. Tobin, as an individual, was not in this case. The original motion to intervene, okay, is, and without going historically, but the order clearly sets forth, okay, which is the court's findings, fact, conclusions of law, which people are more than welcome to agree or disagree with, and there's time periods in which people can do whatever they need to do in accordance with applicable law, if they agree or disagree, is. Part of the reason why the court said what it did for background information is the court in no way was condoning that the parties did not notify the court of the correct parties' names, okay? It happens sometimes in different cases, okay? Sometimes people don't tell me about the correct servicers when servicers change in banks. Sometimes parties don't tell me when new people purchase property. It does happen in different cases, okay? It doesn't in any way excuse it, and I'm picking some cases that happen more in property-related cases. It happens in non-property-related cases as well. It in no way condones that, but it does happen. But just because parties incorrectly include individuals, like sometimes it happens when parties maybe defaulted out, or maybe a party, I've had a case, in fact, it was on earlier this, no, it was on this morning, um, about a couple weeks ago. A person passed away, and the attorneys didn't timely substitute it for an estate, in one case, another case, it was an administrator, okay, where they need to do so, pursuant to different rules. That doesn't mean, in the very easy example, when someone's passed away, they obviously can't still be part of the case, right? It doesn't mean that the deceased person is still alive and part of the case, just because they've left them in a caption. Leaving somebody in a caption, including them in a joint case conference report, including them in a stipulation incorrectly, does not mean that the person is part of a case that the parties have done that. Parties submitting an improper order to the court doesn't mean that somebody is in a case. That means that the parties submitted an improper order to the court, which they shouldn't have done, which could potentially submit parties to sanctions, but it doesn't give somebody standing to be in a case when they're not in the case, just from a pure legal standpoint. The court has to look at, and the court makes a determination. This court did make that determination in its order, not only in its motion to intervene. Now, sometimes people put inconsistent statements and sometimes there's inconsistencies in an order, and so therefore the court has to clarify what the court's intention is when it grants relief, because sometimes there's inconsistencies. 
I will tell you, sometimes people put in one part of an order, they put with prejudice, in another part of an order, they may put without prejudice. And so the court has to clarify the intention, sometimes either in that order, doesn't get caught, sometimes later on, whether the court was intending with prejudice or without prejudice, because there's a big distinction, okay? So those type of things do need to get clarified. So the court, in its order of June 24, 2019, with NEO that same day, notice of entry of order, clearly set forth the history of the case. Now, any party is welcome to agree or disagree with it and do whatever rights they feel that they need to do, perfectly fine. The court neither encourages or discourages. All parties have the full rights to do what they need to do. It's perfectly fine. But the court's intention when it granted the motion to intervene was based on the information presented to the court back when it granted the motion to intervene, that the only party that could intervene that had any rights to that property was the Gordon B. Hansen Trust was the owner of the property at the time, and so only the trustee of the Gordon B. Hansen Trust, whether it was the Gordon B. Hansen Trust 2008 or was the Gordon B. Hansen Trust 2008 modified 2011, whichever it was phrased different ways at different times, but that the trustee, there was no individual rights. And in fact, although it did not come to this court's attention until 2019 that there was even any quit claim deed, the very quick claim deed that was not presented to this court until, i be careful because I'm about to do 2017. No, presented to this court. I'm saying when it was presented. In the court record, multiple times. Counsel, and it was not presented to this court until a pleading presented to this court until 2019. That quick claim deed that you're referencing does not even show that the purported quick claim deed, now once again, the court's never even seen the underlying trust document, so the court doesn't know. At the least court doesn't, half a dozen times in the record. Ms. Tobin, Ms. Tobin, the court's never been presented with a trust document. The court's never been presented whether or not the trust document would even allow a quick claim deed. The court's never even been presented whether you are or not the trustee, and the court doesn't take any position one way or another, whether or not you could or could not even done a quick claim deed. But taking the quick claim deed that was publicly filed that was presented to the court in 2019, attached to some pleading, doesn't even show that that purported quick claim deed, okay, whether it was allowed to be done or not, that that quick claim even occurred until March 27, 2017, which was after you sought intervention. So even in the best case scenario, the intervention by the trustee occurred, the request to intervene in this case, the motion to intervene was November 2016. Your quick claim deed was until March 27, 2017. So you couldn't have asserted that you came in in an individual capacity when the very quick claim deed that you assert gave you any rights as an individual did not even occur until March 27, 2017. That was a very document that you presented. You also presented in other pleadings to this court that it was not only you, but I believe it was a son of the Gordon B. Hansen Trust was the other beneficiary, and that that individual also had rights. So while the court takes absolutely no position whatsoever, that near date that you filed a motion to intervene in November 2016, and you don't have a quick claim deed until March of 2017 to even assert that you would have any individual rights, means that the trustee could have only been the only party that could have intervened into this case. And I'm not saying that's not a ruling today. I'm just trying to give you an example of the evidence presented to this court to try and assist you. The court's not making any ruling because the court's not addressing your motions. I'm just trying to give you an example so you have an understanding of part of the evidence that was presented to this court. I'm not taking any position whatsoever. I'm just mentioning a piece of the evidence presented in the record. For purposes of today, the challenge that this court has, I've heard what you've said, whether I can consider it. The court, in listening to what you've said, is not, well, I've heard what you've said. The record is such that you have counsel of record. The fact that people impermissibly in error as subsequently stated and shown by the evidence presented to this court, 
okay? Council sometimes even get their own clients wrong. I won't call out any council currently, you know, firms that are sitting here in court that sometimes because they represent a lot of banks may mention the wrong bank, okay? And then have to correct it later on. Or sometimes the wrong homeowners association. Or sometimes the wrong third party purchaser, if I were to happen to mention, you know, which I'm not mentioning, you know, that happens sometimes, okay? Or people who represent a lot of different parties sometimes mention the wrong party. Sometimes even in trial, it does happen. That does not mean that that person, that entity, et cetera, comes into a case. And sometimes it happens for a long period of time. Sometimes it happens, unfortunately, all the way through the midst of trial, and then things have to get fixed in the midst of trial. And sometimes there's motion practice in the midst of trial, but things need to get taken care of as a result of that. But that being said, the issue before this court is, can this court hear the various motions that you have filed under the name Nona Tobin, an individual? This court cannot. This court cannot for a multitude of different reasons. To the extent that the motions have been filed by you as an individual, you're not an individual in this case because even, first off, the only person who intervened in this case that a hearing was held and intervention was granted, proper intervention was granted, was Nona Tobin as trustee of the Gordon B. Hansen Trust. The fact that a motion to withdraw inadvertently came before Judge Barker, who sat as a senior judge, and inadvertently the minutes said individual. The counsel shouldn't have said, I'm not Judge Barker, Judge Barker sat for me. He inadvertently, they, the minutes inadvertently said individual. Just because your counsel filed it as an individual, that is. It was intended to be as an individual. The Gordon B. Hansen Trust was closed in 2017. It was without assets. I took the title when the trust was closed. Ms. Tobin, and Ms. Tobin, what I'm trying to say is the party that was in this case, this Nona Tobin as an individual, was never a party in this case. In order to become a party in this case, there had to be granted intervention, substitution, or something. The court cannot provide legal advice. Nona Tobin as an individual was never granted in this case, there was never any pleading filed that made Nona Tobin an individual part of this case. Incorrectly, pleading said it galore, and the court noted that specifically in its order of June 24, 2019, and attempted to clarify the record by setting forth it was noted and that it was incorrectly done, and then clarified that I dropped it both in the footnote and in the body of that order, and tried to clarify it so it made it clear. And I did it in that order. And so the only party intended by this court to ever be granted intervention was the party that sought intervention, and that party sought intervention, trustee of the Gordon B. Hansen Trust, and sought intervention before that quick claim deed even existed. And that's the only party that came into this case. There was no other intervention granted on behalf of any other as you as an individual. Now whether or not you assert certain things did or did not happen, I have to look at the cases before this department, Department 31, in these two cases that were consolidated, the only intervention was granted was as trustee of the Gordon B. Hansen Trust. That's the only thing that happened. There was no subsequent relief granted. There was no other motion that was actually heard, that was timely filed, heard, and any relief granted. To the extent that parties inadvertently, incorrectly, however you'd like to say it, put things on captions, put things on pleadings, argued things, and presented things to the court incorrectly, they shouldn't have done it. It was done. It happened. It got clarified. To the extent that counsel tried, filed different things the way that they filed it, you have to ask them why they did it. The court doesn't know. But the actual record clearly was intervention only on behalf of the trustee. That's the only thing that this court signed. That's the only thing this court intended to sign. That's the only thing this court's order clarified that it intended to sign, and the only thing that this court granted. No one can add anything that this court doesn't sign and intend to sign. Parties can't. No one did it. This court didn't sign it. It can't be part of the case unless this court grants it. 
or some other court directs me that it was granted. And there's no appellate order saying that this court has was told to do it. So that's where this case stands. So therefore, anything filed on your by you individually, because A, regardless of which way you phrase it, whether you assert that you did it as an individual or you assert you did it as a trustee, either, either way, must confirm when they came into the case, they incorrectly said they represented you as an individual and as trustee. So even if they said it that way as both, or they said it that way as purely as trustee, they still have not withdrawn because they've not filed an order and notice of entry thereof, they still represent Ms. Tobin in whatever capacity is being asserted because they've not filed an order. So even if assert that you're in as an individual, still by not filing an order, but you're not in as an individual, but even under that scenario, which doesn't exist, they still have not filed an order and notice of entry thereof, which means the only pleadings that can get filed on behalf of Ms. Tobin in any capacity whatsoever would be by the Mushkin firm, not by Ms. Tobin. So that means the court cannot consider any pleadings filed by you, Ms. Tobin, which means the court can't consider any of those, which means they're all rogue documents, which means they all have to be stricken. All right, uh, understanding that, I uh, would just make one last request. Sure. Is that I, I will be gone, and um, on the 10th, when there's um, a discussion about Sun City Anthem getting um, attorney's fees, first, it wasn't timely, but second, the Gordon B. Hansen Trust does not exist. The fees, whoever, whoever gets them, gets them from me, an well, individual. I can't, okay, I can't advance and address something that potentially could be heard on the 10th, and you can appreciate why, right? Because it's not yet to be heard. Let me finish cleaning up what's set for today, and then we'll see if somebody needs to move a hearing because you may be out of town, okay? But remember, you as an individual are not part of this case. So we're not there yet, but okay. So let me take care of today first. Today, any pleadings filed by Nona Tobin, Okay, I have to strike, which means I also have to strike any oppositions and any replies. I'm going to, you've heard the position of the court. I had given you an opportunity to respond to that. I have not given yet an opportunity for anyone at this table who filed oppositions to any of those motions that were filed by Ms. Tobin. I'm not talking about any motions or any pleas that were filed by the Mushkin firm. I'm talking about pleas filed by Ms. Tobin. Does anyone wish to be heard? at this table, on behalf of the HOA. I'm going to informally say the HOA, the bank, a third party purchaser, just to make my life easy. Is that only, you know, you mentioned that the... Anything that's on for today oh. was filed by Ms. Okay. Tobin. Anyone who's filed any oppositions? Yes. I just, the court's intention, if the pleadings could not be filed, that means also the oppositions couldn't get filed. Because to the extent that their oppositions to rogue documents, generally those would get stricken too because if the documents themselves are rogue documents, then either people usually withdraw or the court strikes oppositions there too. Now the court understands that sometimes oppositions include counter motions. That's why the court's asking the parties what the parties would like to do. Well, Your Honor... Uh, Without substantive arguments. I'm kind of trying to do the quick version because I also have other people who are here quick, for... Quick version. My clients... Uh, did not file an opposition, it was a response and a counter motion. So the response is basically, it's not, a, it's not acknowledging the rogue documents, but the counter motion is asking for the rogue documents to be stricken mm -hmm. for attorney's fees. And, and one of the, uh, the significant rogue document is the list pendants that was filed in this case. Okay. Right. By Ms. Tobin individually. Okay, HOA. I would uh, respond similarly. We filed also a uh, joiner to Mr. Hung's um, response and counter motion, and included the counter motion to be Ms. Tobin as a vexatious litigant. Um, and I'm not sure how Your Honor wants to handle that, given your um, decision today that the that those documents are rogue and are to be stricken. And that's that's on for hearing, I believe, on the tenth. Yeah. Part of it's on for hearing today, and part of it's on for hearing on the tenth. 
Let me tell you in advance where I, you want to hear the court's inclination for the things that are on for hearing today only? Sure. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Here's the court's inclination on for hearing today only. Oh, I didn't hear. Do you have a position bank one way or another? Or do you I think you... I don't think so. I have a position. Okay. The court's inclination is as follows. The court's inclination is the parties have created this mess. The court's not inclined to grant attorney's fees to anyone on anything. Because I think the parties, and I'm using the generic term parties, I think the parties in totality filed way too many pleadings in this case, including when, the, when you all reformed the caption that you, that as attorneys, you kept certain names on certain pleadings, filed motions including certain parties that did not exist in this case, that you kept it on for way too long. The court doesn't see any basis to award anyone any attorney's fees. The court's inclined to grant the motion to expunge the loose pendants because it's an improper loose pendants on its own. The court's already given, made multiple rulings in this case and there's no basis for a loose pendants, so the court's inclined to grant that. But the court is not inclined to grant any attorneys to anyone because I think all the parties throughout this case left certain Ms. Tobin in as an individual way too long on this case when you all should have investigated it a lot earlier and shouldn't have continued to file a variety of pleadings and other documents with this court instead of looking at your own documents and realize the mistake way sooner and should have as your duties as attorneys to notify the court of the error. That's the court's inclination. So I think you create your own mess. Mess not being my most legalese way of phrasing it, but I think you created your own issues which have resulted in today. And I think that is why the court's not inclined to grant any fees to anyone for anything that's on for today. The court makes no advance ruling on anything that may be on for any other date other than today. May I, Your Honor, briefly? I just gave you an inclination. Sure, of course you may. I can't speak for the other parties, <clears throat> but my clients, since Your Honor made it very, very clear as to Ms. Tobin not being a party as an individual, has since. My, 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 my analysis goes back to 2016. Okay, and I'm not, I'm going to about 2018 when all this was uncovered, and Your Honor said clean up the captions. My clients... You mean the, bef the you mean after you were reformed the caption once and still kept the error in? Well, no, no. My, my clients have only filed pleadings that conform to the caption of Ms. Tobin not being an individual. You might so, want to look historically. Well, what I'm trying to say is this, Your Honor. Over the last three or four months, and even at the time of trial, at the bench trial, Your Honor made it abundantly clear to Ms. Tobin that she was not a party as an individual. Your Honor made it very, very clear. So I don't think it's fair for my client to have to pay attorney's fees when she's filing these rogue documents as an individual. It's, it's just not fair. There was no order in her. Counts, please. One at a time, please, so we have clarity of record, please. I mean, I mean, that's, and I know what Your Honor's saying, like it's all the party's fault, but in terms of the I caption, didn't use the word fault. Well, not fault, the okay, fact a mess, that's... okay. But the bottom line is, as Your Honor remembers, Ms. Tobin has been literally at almost every hearing for the last three or four months. And Your Honor, at almost every hearing, repeatedly stated she is not a party as an individual. So why does my client then get penalized for having to pay attorney's fees to me in having to respond to rogue documents? At the very least, if Your Honor is going to incline to grant the uh, motion to expunge the list pendants, that alone should be, there should be attorney's fees for that. HOA? I have no further response. My request for attorney's fees is related to the account motion that have her deemed a vexatious litigant, which is next week. So I've got no attorney's fee request on for today. You had a join you had a joinder. Didn't you have a joinder to Mr. Holmes? Yeah, I, I did, but I didn't provide the requisite information. We just we just lumped it into our own separate account motion. No worries. I just since you had a joinder, you always have an opportunity to speak when you have a joinder. Okay. Well, <coughs> the challenge I have here is
I still have an attorney. I don't have the attorney here, do I? Well, you have the attorney for the trust, but... Where I don't you? have the attorney for the trust here, do I? No, but today it's not for the trust. It's for Ms. in as an individual. All of her motions today was filed by her in her individual capacity. So they're all rogue documents. They're just all rogue documents. And she's still represented by counsel who's supposed to be paying attention to what her client's doing, in, aren't they? Well, her counsel represents her in, in the capacity as a trustee, Your Honor. Actually, take a look at how they filed. Well, yeah, I, I, and that's that's on them, but again, just that's for the, purposes. That's what the court has to evaluate, doesn't it? Yeah, just for the purposes of today, we are here on Ms. Tobin's rogue motions. There's two, a motion to dismiss and a motion to alter an amendment filed by her in her individual capacity. My clients filed a response refusing to With no courtesy copies. Uh, right, right. And if that's, if that's the reason your Honor, your Honor doesn't want yeah. to grant attorney's fees, but what I'm trying to impress upon your Honor is this isn't the first instance. It's not like she's an innocent pro, pro per where she didn't know what she was doing. She knew she was never a party in this case as an individual. She knew that repeatedly. So again, I, I'm just impressing upon the court as why is it fair for my client to incur fees when these rogue pleadings are being filed? In fact, this goes back to May, because you remember in May there was some rogue pleadings filed and Your Honor made it very clear back in May saying you are not a party in, as an individual. This went back to me. I think even Nation Star's predecessor law firm filed one with her names on it. That's why they're being so nice and quiet right now. But I can represent to you, Your Honor. Their own individual right. case conference report by chance. Right. As of, if, if you look back to the record, as of that May oh, hearing, the May 10th or what's, it was mid May, from that hearing on, my clients correctly captioned it exactly the way it should be. Nona Tobin, as trustee of the Gordon B. Hanson Trust, dated 8-2208, counterclaimant, and then my clients. That's... And the written order was entered on June 24th? Is that what you're saying is when the order was effective? Or was there the some other order that I missed? Mr. Hong is referencing a hearing that you were at, Ms. Tobin. Do you remember the hearing you were at where I, I reminded the, you when you had I counsel, Mr. Kovic? I remember the oral pronouncement, yes. Oh, very good. Um, two different statements. An oral pronouncement directing you that you can't file any pleadings is, does not fall under Division of Family Services while this court in no way provides legal advice. But telling somebody you've got to stop filing impermissible documents is different than a order with regards to a withdrawal, those are two different things. You knew you couldn't keep filing documents, is what Mr. Hong is saying. Because the court told you multiple times, you can't keep filing documents you're represented by counsel. I said it when you were standing over there with Mr. Kopich by your side. I said it when Mr. Kopich was here. I also said it when Mr. Kopich was not here, because he didn't come to a hearing. And didn't, then you remember it was before the trial was supposed to start the first time. And then the first time they were going to, they didn't appear. We were given notice. By opposing counsel. That was not a properly noticed hearing. April 23rd of 19, when all of these uh, were declared rogue and everything, was an M, it was not noticed. It was an ex parte hearing. Excuse me. That is completely incorrect. There is no such thing as an ex parte hearing that happens in open court. But we were given notice that it was moved. There was a court order signed on. April 12th, and it was distributed by Mr. Hong on the 15th, and as the order entered on the 22nd, saying that the hearing was continued. There was never any clerk's notice to me that mine was going to be heard, and then... Because yours can't get heard because you can't file things when you're not in the case. I wasn't there. And it was at that April 23rd, 19, if you check the transcript, that's when all of this misinformation was given to the court. Misinformation. 
about the court history. And I have read and looked at all these transcripts. I have been in this case. Now, it doesn't make any sense if I knew, as Mr. Hong suggests, that I wasn't a party, that I would be doing this. I would have done what I did right before the five-year deadline, is file a case in truth on my own. Mr. Hong. 422-2019, Notice of Entry of Stipulation in Order to Extend Briefing Schedule for Nation Star's Motion to Continue Hearing on your letterhead includes her as an individual. The court, before coming into court today, and I really have to get to my 1030s who are so patiently waiting, and it's completely, un i got to get them taken care of as well. This court's, we all have been doing this for years, is where the court's inclination was. Yes, the court had to keep on asking you. The court even asked you all whether or not the caption was correct because the court did it. And then you all did a stipulation to modify the caption. You still kept Ms. Tobin in as an individual. Because that's what the court recommended. No, the court, Ms. Tobin, first off, it's very impolite to keep interrupting me, and I'm sure you can appreciate that. So please, and you also can't read my mind, okay? And you're also incorrect. You can't read my mind, and no, the court didn't. The court directs the parties, only the parties and their attorneys are supposed to know who they represent. I am not a fly on the wall. I do not have a crystal ball, and I can't read people's minds. Attorneys are supposed to know who their clients are. The attorney's obligations are to know who their clients are, and it's their obligations to get it right, and then to notify the court. And it's their obligations to correct it when they tell the court it's wrong. Okay? It's not for the court to bring it up to the parties and tell them over and over, I think you got your clients wrong. Now, I am a very diligent person, and I work incredibly hard because I want to ensure each and every case gets handled over 120% fairly, equitably, and anybody who appears before this court knows that I work incredibly hard. And just because... I oftentimes will go back and look through the record and sometimes bring it to parties' attention. Can they double-check things or triple-check things? It's still the party's obligations to get their clients correct and to get the records correct as far as who's in the case and who's out of the case. So the court doesn't tell the parties who's in the case and out of the case. It's the party's obligation and to give the correct information to the court. So the court may remind the parties, make sure you get it correct before it goes to trial. But it's the party's obligation, and every single attorney will tell you that, and every pro se litigant has got to get it correct for themselves. So if your name is spelled incorrectly, if you're a pro se litigant, you've got to make sure it's correct. And if counsel, they've got to make sure that their clients are correct. That's the party's obligation. It's part of the duty of candor to the court. That being said, that's where the court's inclination was with regards to not granting attorney's fees. If the parties incorrectly did things on the caption, that doesn't make it that somebody's a part of the case. It just makes it that excusable neglect, inadvertence, there's a lot of different ways to phrase it. You can call it a lot of different things. But it basically just means it was incorrect. And you know what? Things happen. Mistakes happen. Everyone would love to be 100% perfect, but no one's 100% perfect. Mistakes happen. And you try and get things fixed before it gets to trial. And just because there's oopses that happen, as far as people having incorrect aspects, things get fixed. And things get fixed, and what matters is you have to have a correct record. The court made the record correct in its order in the ruling with regards to the trial. Nona Tobin as an individual was never in this case, never in the consolidated case. Just because the parties inadvertently included your name, I don't know if you told your attorney that you thought you were in the case, and that's the reason why they filed an appearance and put your name on it. I don't know. I'm not asking. But your attorneys and you should have made sure that when they filed their notice of appearance, they did it correctly, just like everybody else should have done it correctly. But they didn't, and it had to get fixed, and it got fixed. So that being said, for purposes of today's motions, the court's already stricken the rogue pleadings. The court has, with regards to the motion for the Liz, to expunge the Liz Pendens, that has to be granted because the court's already made affirmative rulings, and there's no basis for the Liz Pendens to be on the property because of the court's rulings, both pursuant to the summary judgment and the court's findings of 
fact, conclusions of law and judgment. So therefore, there's no basis for there to be a Liz pendants on the property. So the motion to expunge the Liz pendants, it actually phrases a counter, it's a counter motion, excuse me, let me finish, please. Um, that counter motion is granted. To the extent that the counter motion also asks to strike the rogue motions, that has to be granted because they are rogue motions for the two reasons stated. One, Ms. Tobin is not an individual in this case, and so nothing could be filed by Ms. Tobin as an individual. Second, and these are two independent reasons, to the, the only Tobin party in this case is represented by counsel, the Mushkin firm, even as of today because they've not filed an order. And so therefore, any pleadings filed on behalf of any Tobin party would have been have to been filed by the Mushkin firm. They were not filed by the Mushkin firm, so they wrote pleadings on either of those two bases. And on a third basis, to the extent any of those pleadings are asking for affirmative relief, which would be contrary to NRCP 62.1 and Honeycutt, the court couldn't have granted those anyway. To the extent that they would fall within the Honeycutt and NRCP 62.1, even if the other two aspects would be, i.e. the motion for a new trial, but the court can't consider them anyway because of procedural issues, the court's not inclined to grant the relief, so they'd have to be denied anyway because there was no basis for them anyway, independently of all the procedural issues, and so that would be the third basis. Okay. With regards to the counter motion for attorney's fees and costs pursuant to EDCR 7.60 and the joinder thereto, the court denies without prejudice that relief requested because the court finds that the lack of clarity in the pleadings over the multitude of years is really a multi-party issue caused by all of the parties and therefore the court wouldn't hold a pro se non-litigant because Ms. Tobin is not a litigant because she's not in this case as an individual capacity. However, she's present personally but would not hold her personally liable. A, she's a non-litigant, not a part of this party, not a part of this case, so she can't be held liable for the fees because she's not a party to this case. B, you wouldn't find it even as finding her as an individual if for some reason she's here and somehow could otherwise be held. I don't have jurisdiction over her because she's not a party to this case. But even somehow if the court could, I wouldn't find it appropriate to assess the fees against her because the confusion was caused in part by all the other parties continuing to keep improper names in captions, etc., and only blatantly brought it to the attention of the court, the inaccuracy. So it was really caused by everyone. Was it initially caused by the Tobin parties with the first pleading? Yes, but then it was compounded by not getting fixed by the other parties. So therefore, the fees and costs are denied without prejudice. With regards to that should have taken care of all of these motions for today, for all the different reasons cited there in. So, with regards to the motion on the 10th, one of those motions cannot be heard. The motion, Nona Tobin's opposition and counter motion cannot be heard because that has to be stricken for the same reason the court already says that cannot be heard on the 10th. The motion for attorney's fees by Sun City Anthem, do you still wish the court to leave that on for the 10th? Yes, Your Honor. This is, this is filed with Mr. Coppedge's firm against the trust, not Ms. Tobin individually. So yes, we'd like that motion okay, to stay so on. Okay, so that still remains on That's the 10th. That's an independent motion, yes. I'm just saying. That still remains on the 10th. Okay. So, that remains as is. The court has made all rulings with regards thereon. Now, who's going to be preparing these orders and get it to the court timely under EDCR 7.21? Someone has to prepare these orders because it's not going to be the court. I'll prepare them, Your Honor. Okay, and you're going to circulate to the proper parties and make sure that they are detailed orders that don't just say denied without prejudice. They need to articulate the independent various bases, please. Of course, Your Honor. I would definitely appreciate it. Thank you so Your very Honor, much. Just one minor thing. Can you start being excused from participating in that order? Have you waived signature on the order? Yes. Okay, so please note that waive signature in open court, okay, on all the orders? Yes. So just, just for clarification, this order will be sent to Mr. Hong and Mr. Coppedge's office since that's he is it. still right. attorney of record and that's Still that's attorney it. of record as of today? Okay. Yes. Thank you so very much. And remember, the trust can't be represented by an individual anyway. Right. My apologies for my 1030s. I really do apologize, but you can appreciate Okay, well, I'll send it to the end. Okay, so 1030 cases. You're here on which one? Because I'll call you first. You're on Lopez? Page 2, Your Honor, yes. Page 2, Lopez versus Rosso.